Today we're going to do part one of our population ecology lecture. So to begin this, I really want to talk about what is ecology. Ecology is the study of interactions among organisms and their environment. And ecologists tend to spend most of their time and energy trying to address two big questions. The first question is, why do species occur in some places and not others? And the second question is, how do interactions between organisms impact their biology? So over the next week or so, as we go through ecology, these are the two large questions we're, an, we're asking. And most of what we look at will be ways to quantify and measure trying to answer elements of these questions. Biology is made up of a series of levels of organization. Starting at the very bottom, we have the atom, and each level builds on the previous one. So for example, we go from the atom to molecules, molecules to cells, cells to tissues, tissues to organs, organs to organ systems, and finally organ systems come together to form organisms, or what we tend to think of as living things. Living things, of course, can be broken into even higher groups, populations, communities, and ecosystems, and ultimately the biosphere, which is all life on Earth and everything in that area. Ecology tends to focus on these higher levels, where biology focuses on all of them. Ecology starts with the organism and spends most of its time looking at levels like population, community, and finally, ecosystems. So that is going to be where we're going to focus. And in today's particular presentation, we're going to focus on the level of populations. So let's define a population. A population is a group of species living in the same place at the same time. It basically incorporates members of a, that have the potential to interbreed with each other. So when you talk about a population, all of the individuals need to be of the same species and capable of interbreeding. If you're talking about two different species, those are the two different populations, not the same population. And populations have certain new characteristics that are unique to populations that do not apply to organisms and do not apply to communities. So let's take a look at some of these characteristics and things that when we talk about populations, we might be studying or discussing. The first one, geographic range. Where is this particular species found? What areas? And you can see in a diagram here, these are monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies travel around North America. During the summertime, they spread throughout many, many parts of the United States especially the northern and western portions. And then during the springtime and fall, they tend to migrate through the southern U.S. and they spend their winters in a very small area in Mexico. So this would classify as the geographic range of monarch butterflies, where they are found <coughs> throughout the year. Um, and certain seasons, they tend to be found in certain areas versus others. So that's a kind of characteristic that you might look at if you're studying populations. Another one, because populations are made of groups, how are individuals spatially distributed within an area? And there are three basic spatial distribution patterns we tend to see. One, clumped. Second is random. And the third one is uniform. So what do I mean by this? Imagine that you are swimming in the ocean and you're looking around and most of the area you just see empty water. But over on your left, you see a school of fish like we see in this picture here. And then over on the right, about 100 yards away, you see another school of fish. This would be an example of clumped distribution patterns where you have fair numbers of individuals in some areas and other areas, absolutely nothing. So they're clumped in space. Often they're clumped because they are distributed around key important resources. Another distribution pattern is random. Random distribution patterns, it's there's no distinct pattern on where individuals are found, they just randomly occur. <clears throat> sometimes they occur in one area, sometimes they don't. Random pattern might occur, for example, if a certain tree or a dandelion, for example, is releasing seeds on the wind, and the wind blows in, then the seeds will fall to the ground randomly. That might be an example of a random distribution pattern. And then finally, we have uniform distribution pattern. 
uniform distribution pattern is there's an equal distance between each individual. These are most commonly seen in things that humans do. For example, when we plant crops, we tend to plant each of them a specific distance from the previous one. But it does occur in the wild, and there's a picture here showing some penguins on a colony. The reason penguins form uniform distribution patterns on nesting colonies is because each one will set up a nest just out of pecking range of its neighbor. So since penguins are roughly the same size and they can reach out and peck the same distance, each of them will be just far enough so they can't get pecked by their neighbor when sitting on their own nest. So these are our different spatial distribution patterns. Another thing we might look at is abundance. And to do this, we might look at the population's density and the population's size. Population density are the number of individuals per unit of area. So I might say, how many individuals in a hectare or an acre or in a square mile, a square kilometer, any given space, how many individuals are there? And if it's liquid, it might be in volume. In a cubic meter of water, how many shrimp occur, for example. And this is fairly easy to measure. I don't have to measure every individual in a population. I just need to go into the given area and measure how many individuals are there. So population density is pretty easy to measure and is a commonly used value when studying ecology. Population size is another thing we might want to know. How many individuals are there in the population? This potentially is very challenging to measure because to be accurate, you have to include every single living individual in your count. And that is often difficult to do. Now, how, many how many birds are there in North America? Oh my goodness, I, we have to go count every single bird in North America. That's often not realistic. And so often what they will do is they will take the population density of a particular species, and then they'll figure out what's the total area that species occurs in and use the density to estimate the population size. So we have ways to estimate rather than having to go out and collect every single individual. It's important to understand when we talk about population densities, the population densities are dynamic. They change. Now they can change year to year. They could change during the season, uh, springtime, summertime, wintertime, and so on, so on. But they do fluctuate. Now look at this image here, this graph. What I have is I have three different species, but from right now I'm only going to focus on the acorns. Okay, Acorns here, which is done in red. The acorns, acorns come off of oak trees, and they are the seed that can grow another oak tree. So we're looking at population density. How many of them are in, it looks like, square meters, or two square meter squares. Um, so, you can see in 1994, there was a high population density. Then we had a major drop in density. It went up, and it's going down. So from year to year, we're having some pretty major fluctuations. Here it only went up a little, went to some more, and now it's staying pretty low. In contrast, let's undo that. This time, let's look at our other one rodents. Rodents include mice, rats, things like that. Well, rodents eat acorns, don't they? So our rodents, you'll see, went down, up. They also fluctuated a great deal. But what I want to point out here, if you look, in general, there is a, re a relationship between the rodents and the acorns. So I have my rodents there. The acorns, let's go ahead and do those in blue just to make, do the first couple. As my acorns go up, generally when the rodents are down, and when the rodents are up, the acorns are down. Why would that be? Well, one possible explanation is as more acorns are available, that is because there are fewer rodents to eat them, and therefore they're more available. As we get more rodents, we have fewer acorns. And so we have this reversed relationship. As one goes up, the other goes down. 
Another element of this is that there is a delay in the rodent population responding to the acorns. So initially, so if we look in this early section, right here in 93 through 95, 96, that area, there were a lot of acorns and there weren't very many rodents, but that's a lot of food for rodents to eat. And so the rodents, lots of food available, their fitness increased. And as a result, their numbers went up. As their numbers went up, the acorn numbers went down because they were being eaten. As a result, not much food, the ma many of these rodents are going to starve. They're not going to be able to eat, and so their numbers go down. Fewer rodents eating the acorns, the acorn numbers go up. So sometimes the relationship is a delayed one. Rodents can't start reproducing heavily until there's enough food around. Once food drops, rodents don't die instantly. They gradually die off and have fewer offspring, and so their numbers go down and go up in response to the amount of food available. But there's a delay as we look at how two different populations interact with each other. When we talk about population, we are going to get into a bit of math because we need to calculate things. When you're talking about a group, one of the things you want to know is well, I have a population size, but how fast is that population size increasing? Is it going up? Is it going down? How many births are there? How many deaths are there? And such. And so to do that, we need to understand a couple terms. Generally, when we're talking about population size, you will hear us refer to N. N is the sample size or the population size. How many pop members are in the population? But we're going to clarify something here. We're going to have two different n's. For example, here I have n sub t. These are the number of individuals in a population at a given point in time. So right now, the population size is x. In contrast, we also have what we call n sub t plus 1. These are the number of individuals in the population at some time in the future. So right now, plus one, so in the future. So we often were talking about what our current population size, but we also make predictions about what the population size would be down the road. Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? And so to do things like that, we need to look at individuals being added to a population and removed from a population. We're gonna keep it really simple. We're not gonna think about immigration, immigration. No individuals are moving, they're not going anywhere else. Instead, the only way we're adding individuals here is by births, and we'll represent births with a capital B. And the only way we're losing individuals is by deaths, which represents capital D. So given that, our population at any given time in the future will be the current population plus the number of births minus the number of deaths. And we can also calculate the population growth. How quickly is it growing? The population growth represented by D sub n. D represents what we call delta. You might have seen that in a math problem as a triangle, and it represents the change. So the population is growing at the rate of births minus deaths. So let's apply this. Let's see if we can do it and realize this is much easier than it sounds like when you're looking at equations. Okay, here is a population of 10 females, and we are recording two pieces of data. One, are those females, are each of them alive at the end of the day, or I'm sorry, the end of the year or not? The second thing is, do they have any offspring, and if so, how many? So, how many total births occurred in the sample population? So, we have one, two, three, four, five. So, our total births, births, okay, is five. How many deaths do we have in the population? Well, look, here's one, that one died, and that one died. We don't have any information saying the babies died, not gonna worry about that. Okay, so deaths, D equals two. So what's the population growth rate over a one year period? Well, the growth is births minus deaths. 5 minus 2 
So the growth rate is three. We started the year with 10 individuals. At the end of the year, we lost two adults and gained five offspring, giving us a, we started with 10, and we ended with a total of 13 individuals. We have increased it by three because it's a positive number, okay? So we can look at populations and say, are they growing and how quickly? Well, it's very common when we start talking about population growth, again, trying to record every single individual is unrealistic. And so instead, we'll go out and we'll take a sampling. We'll record birth and death uh, rates among a sample of the population. And when we do that, you'll note in my example a minute ago, instead of writing big B, I wrote little b. Instead of writing big D, I wrote little d. If technically, if you are using the capital letters, big B, big D, that means you've counted every individual in the population. So fantastic, you can use that. More likely though, we're using a representation. And so in that case, we use the lower case to represent a sample that represents the larger case. Okay, so we are going to estimate the number of offspring for, that the average individual produces. And we call this per capita growth, per individual. Okay, so for example, we can do the per capita birth rate. These are the number of individual, the average number of individuals everyone in the population has. You might have heard uh, something at one point like, oh, the average family in the United States has 2.3 kids. No one has a 0.3 kid. No one has partial children. But we're giving a per capita an average. The average person has 2.3 offspring over the course of their lifetime. So that's what per capita means. So how do we calculate this? Well, the per capita birth rate is very simple. It's the number of individuals born divided by the total number of individuals in the population. The per capita death rate is the number of individuals that die divided by the total number of individuals in the population. And the per capita growth rate will simply be little b, the per capita birth rate, minus the per capita death rate. Okay. And that per capita growth rate, we call it R. That's an important value. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. Let's give this a practice. Okay, let's apply the concept. So we have a population of 750 fish. That fish right there is a puffer fish. You might recognize that. You might not. There are kind of fish that can blow up to scare off predators. Now, of our 750 fish, 25 of them die on a particular day and 12 of them are born on a particular rate. So, what is the per capita birth rate? Well, B equals the number born, which is 12, divided by the total number of individuals, 750. If we do that, we get 0 0.016. So there are 0.016 fish born per day, per individual. Okay, what about the per capita death rate? So D, the death rate equals the number that died, 25, divided by the number of individuals in the population, 750, and that tells us that 0 0.033 individuals die, or fish die per day, per individual. Okay. So what is the per capita growth rate? Well, the per capita growth rate, R, is B, number per capita births, minus D, per capita deaths, or 0 0.016 minus 0 0.033, which equals 0 0.017. That is our per capita growth rate. Well, that's great. I have a number. What exactly does that mean? Well, to understand R, Here's the main takeaway you need to understand R. If R is positive, if we have a positive value here, that means the population has more births than deaths. And over time, we would expect that population to be growing, to get bigger. The bigger R is, the faster it will grow. In contrast, if R is negative, 
that means there are fewer births than deaths and the population is decreasing. Okay, the population is going down and over time it will get lower and lower. How quickly? The lower R is, the more negative, the faster it's decreasing. Finally, if R equals zero, that tells us that we have an equal number of births and deaths and the population will remain constant. It will not grow and it will not shrink over time. It will remain constant because we are replacing individuals at the same rate we are losing them. So, so what? Okay. <laughs> Who really cares here? Well, populations will only stay the same if birth rates equal death rates. And frequently, that's not the case. Okay, so species distributions often reflect the effect of the environment on per capita growth rates. Okay, so if a species can't, it can't persist if R, its per capita growth rate, is negative. In places where species are not found, it's because they have a negative population growth rate. They might move into the area, but they cannot maintain a growth rate to sustain it, and they will disappear. On the other hand, places where you find that species shows that they are able to maintain a positive R growth rate, and therefore they occur in that area. So the question at this point then becomes, well, why do they have a negative R growth rate or a positive R growth rate? And that's something we'll get into coming up ahead. One thing that's really important to understand is species need resources to survive, uh, food, water, shelter, and other resources. <coughs> and the availability of resources and their physical conditions will shape life histories for individual species. Some resources are super abundant. Okay, there's enough for everyone. For example, oxygen. When I'm in a classroom with a bunch of students, I am not worried about any one student using up my oxygen. There is enough oxygen for all of us. It is abundant. I don't even think about it. I can get as much as I want. So can everyone. That is not true for all resources, though. Some resources are limited. Okay, we call them limited resources. And that means that there's not enough for everyone. And individuals compete with each other to get enough of the resource. Not everyone is going to get enough. It will run out before everyone gets the amount they want. So some will get it and some will not. And limited resources have a huge impact on a species and a species ability to survive within an area. We also have an ecological principle called the principle of resource allocation. So the principle of resource allocation says that once an organism has acquired a unit of resource, for example, food, that bit of resource cannot be used for multiple functions at the same time. So that food contains energy, and that energy needs to be used for something. But it can't be used for multiple things. If I'm going to dedicate that energy toward respiration, I can't use it for something else. If I'm going to dedicate it to store for later use, well, then I can't use it right now. I have to make a decision of any resource. How am I going to use that resource? And so basically, organisms are constantly making choices about how to spend different resources that they obtain. Now, if the resources are super abundant, they can spend it any way they want because they can always get more. But if they're limited, they have to make choices. So when we're talking about resource acquisition, we're really talking about resource allocation. How are we going to spend those resources? And in general, species use resources in four areas. They use them for maintenance, just maintaining the body and living. They use them for defense against threats, for growing, and for reproduction. So almost everything we use them for falls into one of these four categories. So how do we actually break up the use of these resources in normal, typical conditions where the normal amount of resources are available? The most important category is maintenance, the ongoing life and survival of the individual. If you don't provide enough energy and resources to maintain your existence, growth, reproduction, and uh, defense don't matter because you'll be dead. 
So you have to match maintenance. And then you can put energy toward defense, growth, and reproduction. Okay, what about in a situation where we have an abundance of resources? It has been a fantastic year, tons of resources available. I am not only able to meet my maintenance needs, <clears throat> but I have a lot of leftover energy, a lot of leftover resources I can use for things. Well, when that happens, I can now put a lot of energy toward defense, a lot of energy toward growth, and a lot of energy toward reproduction. So that's, in an ideal world, I'm able to put resources in all these areas if there's a super abundance of resources. But what happens under stressful conditions when there aren't many resources? We're running out. Maybe a drought happens. There's not as much food and stuff. How do I partition my use of the resources? Well, once again, maintenance is the most important. Survival and maintaining my existence is the most important. I'm not going to be able to spend much on defense, growth, or reproduction. In fact, in that, those situations, many species won't reproduce at all. They'll save energy, not reproduce that year, with the hope of having better years in the future. So anytime we obtain resources of any type, our bodies, consciously or unconsciously, have to make choices about how we spend those resources. Normally, we put as much as we can as we need toward maintenance, and then we divvy it up between the other categories. When resources are abundant, everything gets lots of energy, no problem. But when resources are rare, or we're running out of something, something's very limiting, we focus on maintenance, and the other areas have to fall away until resources become more abundant. And I hope you've gained an understanding of some of the areas that we tend to look at when we're talking about ecology. And we will continue a talk in Population Ecology Part 2.